And what we're going to be talking about today is wire rope terminations, and hopefully you'll find it educational. Okay. <laughs> so really the, the purpose of the presentation, we just wanted to kind of explore the various types of wire terminations that are used throughout the industry, whether they be used in our industry or even somewhat in the crane industry. And, and then to determine the impact that those have on the strength of the wire rope. Um, because in essence, we all look at the published strength of the wire ropes, we base calculations on that and everything else. But in the end, if you're doing something to your wire rope to put a termination on it that significantly changes the strength of that rope, you probably really want to know about that going in. So um, I will throw out a disclaimer here. This was not a scientifically valid uh, evaluation of termination techniques. You know, if we were going to do that, we would have gone in and done, you know, 30 sets of tests on rope to get a baseline, and we'd have done three to five or maybe 10 samples of each one of these. We didn't do that. Um, but to get an idea of where they, they kind of stacked up against one another, we went in and tested one of every one of these types of terminations and on a few of them if we got some abnormal results or something like that we may have gone in and done a second test so but it by no means is to be considered you know a published academic study <laughs> that you know looks at all wire rope terminations so but we did look at a number of different styles we looked at the mechanically swedged using a lot of different types of swedges or number of swedges on it, uh, or I guess compression sleeves. Um, we looked at what at least our supplier calls a Flemish eye. Um, my understanding is there's different uh, definitions and different ways of doing Flemish eyes. So what we did here may not be exactly what you would refer to as a Flemish eye. Um, we looked at Spelzer sockets, which uh, is maybe a little bit new to you, but that's actually one where you're actually pouring liquid material, whether it be epoxy or zinc or something, into a cone shape and have actually locking onto the wire rope and into the socket. Um, we looked at U-clamps, even though we're not supposed to be using U-clamps, we did look at U-clamps. We looked at them a couple of different ways, if you install them correctly and incorrectly. Uh, we looked at fist grips, very common use in the industry, and in order to get a little different perspective on that, we looked at, well, what happens if you put fist grips on right, and what happens if you don't torque them enough? Um, and then finally, we looked at wedge sockets. We looked at both a 3 8 inch wedge socket and a 5 16 inch wedge socket. Part of the reason we did that was because throughout the industry, I've heard people say, I, had, had a, I have a difficult time finding 5 16 inch wedge sockets, so I just use a 3 8 and you know it performs perfectly fine. So we wanted to take a look at that and actually compare the two of them. Question? Yeah, so the partially torqued, um, I, I see two aspects of that, not properly torqued to begin with, but then properly torqued, loaded, and then retorqued. Yeah, we did not look at that. Oh, okay, okay. And, and one of the things that uh, we've had a little bit of discussion, and if there are, you know, when you look at the whole list of everything that we did test, if there are other ones that, that we didn't think of that, you know, or that you're commonly using or you see commonly used in the industry, and you'd like to see those tested, we'd be more than happy to get some samples of those and test them. If there's other things, because what we thought is we'd like to continue to expand this and make it available to you know, SAIA members um, to be able to continue to look at kind of the database of information that we're generating here. So just to kind of put it in perspective, if you go out and you look at the literature and you say, what are these terminations actually supposed to do? If you look at mechanical swedges, they'll tell you that you're supposed to be able to get 100% of the breaking strength of the wire rope. Um, the mechanically swedged eye says the same thing. A Flemish eye says the same thing. You can get 100%. Fist grips, U-clamps, and wedge sockets, the published data tells you don't expect to get more than 80% of what the breaking strength of the wire rope is if you're using those. 
So you'll be able to see actually the performance is a little bit better than that. So how did we do the testing? Um, at Sky Climbers facility in Delaware, Ohio, we have a tensile test machine. And so we set up and conducted all the tests in that tensile test machine. Um, the fixture attachments that we use basically at one end where you had the termination, uh, just simply a block connector to be able to take the, uh, the thimble and be able to shackle it off. On the other end, we actually use the uh, wire rope test fixture. And you can actually see there where we have both of those for when we're testing strictly wire rope. And those are set up so that you're not introducing stress into the wire rope and creating a stress riser that would create premature failure. So we also looked at crosshead speed. And one of the things that you have to be concerned with when you're doing any kind of tensile testing is strain rate sensitivity. And the easiest way, if you're not familiar with what strain rate sensitivity is, if, if you've ever heard of silly putty, um, if you take silly putty and you start to stretch it, you, know, you can take it and stretch 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 it and you can get out to the extent of your arm length and it just keeps stretching. If you take that same piece of silly putty and you know make it about that long and go like that, it'll just break right in two. And so it, it all comes down to the speed at which you're stressing the material. So in order to try to stay away from that where we were kind of shock loading or running it so fast that we were actually you know, getting abnormal results, we tried to keep it down in the, the 0.1 millimeters per second or up to about 0.35 millimeters per second in terms of the crosshead speed. And if you look at that, that is fairly consistent with the ASTM A931-8 uh, standard for doing tensile tests on wire rope, which that particular standard tells you that you're supposed to, I think it's 0 0.032 uh, inches per minute based on the gauge length of the wire that you're testing. And so by staying down in that lower range, we're pretty consistent with the ASTM standard, as well as you can see here, it was pretty stable in that range. So we didn't expect that we were gonna get a lot of variation just simply because of crosshead speed. And, and Mark, I'm assuming this is all new wire rope, right? It's all brand new wire rope, yeah. And basically, I won't say 100% because we had a couple that we added on after, but it was all the exact same lot of wire rope. So we had a 5,000 foot spool. We took a whole bunch of cuts off of that, and that's what all of these things were, were done on. Okay, so uh, the, the wire rope, uh, basically a 5 16 or 8 millimeter, it's a 5 by 26 um, fiber core. This is the standard, it's XXIP, it's the standard rope that uh, you'll find a lot of places in the industry. It's the standard rope that uh, the company that I work for sells. Um, country of origin for this rope is Thailand. And the gauge lengths that we use, if you actually go through the ASTM spec, it tells you that you should be using a 60 inch gauge length. Well, that's one massive test machine. Our test machine is not that big. About the best I could get is a 24 inch gauge length. So we tested some of them at 12, we tested some of them at 24 inches. And then again the fixturing, uh, wrapping around so that uh, it actually takes five wraps around that and then the, the, the free end is clamped off and that's the way we test. So. This is actually a video, um, you know, it, at the beginning, you kind of got to look real close, but you can actually see the wire rope moving a little bit until the point where it actually fails. See the lower one slowly coming down. So, and there you go, and you can see that's what the typical failure looks like. Um, and the normal failure 
that you would see in the wire row. So we look at it and getting into the definition of what the actual products that we put through the testing. You start off with mechanically swage. These are zinc coated copper compression sleeves. That's the upper left. We did two of those. That happens to be the company that I work for. That's our standard that we do is two uh, mechanically swaged copper coated compression sleeves. Um, we did do two aluminum ones. Um, don't know if a lot of people use aluminum and you have to be a little cautious on aluminum because a lot of the manufacturers will tell you that aluminum sleeves, even though they're sized for this size wire rope and everything else, they'll tell you that they're not for lifting. But we can, we'll look at the results. And then we also, another one that we did was the steel compression sleeve. Not something that my company uses, um, but it is commonly used out there. So, and again, the ones that are mechanically swedged here, um, those are done on a, a handheld swedger done in our factory. Like the steel one, that was a company up in Michigan that sells uh, lifting products and so on, and they prepared those for us. Yeah. When you did the uh, compression sleeves, did you go to go gauge them? Yes, we did. That, yeah, that's standard, standard practice in our facility is whenever you swedge it, you always do a go-to-no-go no go on all of them. On the aluminum, I, I talked to years ago, I talked to National Telephone Wire, whoever yep. makes those lateral sleeves that had the specs on them. He said aluminum should be used with aluminum because that's what power companies use mm -hmm. for power lines. And they said the other problem they have is the aluminum and steel, the ionic reaction is, you know, wet and soapy atmosphere. Right, uh, right. And, and, and I'll, I'll be the first to admit on some of these other ones, even if you look at a standard, uh, you know, the a copper yeah. with a uh, zinc coating on it with a galvanized steel wire, in, in a highly salt atmosphere, from a galvanic corrosion standpoint, not a great combination. I mean, the difference on the table is like 0.9, and you're trying to be as close to zero as possible. So, yeah, that, you know, if you're using it in a highly salt atmosphere, you got to be doing a lot of inspection to make sure that you're not getting corrosion. We have another question? That was my statement was the zinc plated on galvanized wire is a bad idea if you live in a coastal area. Yeah. It, it's common though. It, it oh, seems oh, like that's what everybody well, uses well, even though when you look at it from a pure theoretical standpoint it it shouldn't be very good. I have I've done a, as I was doing this I did a fair amount of research though and you know there's a lot of wire that is used in, in sailboats and, and marine and everything else and they said what's interesting is is that even the theory tells you that in a highly salt atmosphere that this is not going to be good for galvanic corrosion but they take stuff that's been in service for you know 10 years they tear it apart and say don't really see the results that the theory would tell you you should see doesn't mean that you should discount that but it seems in practice it's not as bad as what the theory tells us it should be. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be a lot of just CYA because no matter what you're lifting or pulling something and having this thing come apart is not a pleasant experience. I, I, believe me, if, I, you know, if I'm hanging off of something, I don't want any question at all whether that's a, a good, good switch on there or not. That and the copper ones are cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cop, copper without the, the pure, The plain copper without the zinc plating is it's a little bit cheaper yeah. than, the, than the... If you look at it, though, when you look at the, the relative differences, even copper with the steel is not great when it comes to... Get, there is... When you look through the whole thing, there's not a really great alternative to pick that's going to be fantastic on galvanic corrosion. So, uh, again, you know, looking at uh, fist grips, Tried to install them per the, the standard methodology for installing fist grips in terms of spacing, using three fist grips, and the only difference between the two really was um, the one properly installed, we torqued to 30 inch pounds, 
Um, we could have torqued the other one to anything. I selected to do it at 10 inch pounds just to have a fairly distinct difference between the proper and improper installation. How did, did they tell you that? Because you can't see it. Now you can, if, if you, you look at the actual really sample, you can tell that it's braided back into the other wire. Yeah, if you take your wire rope to a certified sling or certex, that's how I've seen it done. Okay. Usually, I don't know who you sent yours to, but I deal with some utility companies, and they'll send the wire rope to certex or certified yeah. sling, and that's how it comes back. Yeah, this this is actually the company that that I selected to do this simply because they were local. It's a company called Commercial Lifting Group. Yeah, exactly. yeah out of Michigan. Yeah. So they're the ones. Uh, and well, I, I take that back because on the Flemish eye, that's what we sent it to commercial lifting group. And I said, I, I want a Flemish eye. And that one came back basically just a thimble, wire rope loop back around on itself and a steel compression slip. That's what they call a Flemish eye. This is actually from, uh, I think it's a Sackhash um, company in Chicago that does these. And this is what when I sent it to him and said, I want a Flemish eye, this is what came back from them. Traditionally in, in, in our industry, Spider's 15 inch braided back into itself eye was called a Flemish eye. And that's what I've always understood that to be, was that, that braided back into itself, not seized with wire, anything like that, just braided back into itself. The guys at I&I &I Sling call what you have there a Molly Hogan. So they don't take the, they don't take the wire and put it back tongue. into the sleeve. They separate it and then uh, twist it back into itself, which you can't do with five strand wire. The old six by nineteen, six by thirty one, you could do that, um, but it doesn't work as well when you we, have we an do odd it with number of strands go back in. We do it with five by twenty yeah, six and it made Flemish eyes, but just like that. Yeah, I think they both Flemish eyes actually. So, traditionally, in, in in our industry, spiders fifteen inch braided back into itself eye was called a Flemish eye. And that's what I've always understood that to be, was that, that braided back into itself, not seized with wire, anything like that, just braided back into itself. The guys at I&I &I Sling call what you have there a Molly Hogan. So they, don't take the, they don't take the wire and put it back into the sleeve, they separate it and then uh, twist it back into itself, which you can't do with five strand wire. The old six by 19, six by 31, you could do that um, but it doesn't work as well when you we, have an we do odd it with number of strings back in. We do it with fiber yeah, yeah, it's and it make Flemish eyes, but just like that. Yeah. I think they both Flemish eyes, actually. So, but so that alone, with the group of people that's in this room, who have been doing wire rope for years and years and years, shows that we have an issue <laughs> just by this. Exactly. <laughs> that's typical construction terminology. We have yeah, 10 right. names for right. one right. thing. And the last one, and okay. seen them in use, and uh, I never actually knew what the official terminology was for them, but they're called a spelter socket. And they can be done with uh, zinc, they can be done with epoxy and so on. The one that we did is actually an epoxy spelter socket. So those are all the different ones that, that we did. So then you get into, okay, what were the test results? So we look at it and just taking the, the first one that came up, this is mechanically swedged, one copper, zinc plated copper. And you can see, you know, we start basically at zero. You're going up. This one broke at about 11,015 pounds. And that's the, the conversion of kilonewtons. And then if you look on the bottom scale, it's the extension. How much did the heads move actually before it broke? Um, 38.4 millimeters, which converts to just slightly over an inch and a half that we actually traveled before we actually got a break in that one. So looking at the next one again, the standard for, for my company, um, this one broke at about the exact same force and the extension was just slightly longer and you got to understand when you put these in and you're wrapping the wire rope around you're going to get a little variation in the extension simply because you're you may be pulling a little bit of slack out of it um, and just to give you an idea again looking at how did the failure occur because that's really i guess from my standpoint in trying to evaluate this i want to see what the failure mechanism was 
And if you look at this, the failure mechanism occurred right at the termination. So the wire strands broke just below the second, the base of the second sleeve. And this is with aluminum. And again, you know, that whole discussion about, you know, aluminum and should it be used in our industry and, and, and you know, is it appropriate for lifting and so on. But if you look at it, a little more extension on the aluminum, but the breaking force was actually a little higher. You know, probably within the variation of the test itself, but slightly over 50 kilonewtons on the, the dual aluminum sleeves. Uh, this one was a, a, a rather interesting one because when you look at it, this is a steel compression sleeve and the failure occurred in the, the wire rope just below the swedge, but it was a complete failure. You can see, if you look at it, there's nothing hanging below that. It severed the entire rope completely. When it got to, it didn't get quite up to that uh, 50 kilonewtons. I think this one was uh, uh, 48 and change. But it, like I said, it was a complete separation, almost like you just took the right angle grinder and just cut the thing off. Okay, so if we look at three fist grips, properly torqued, um, a little more extension, but up in that. 48, 49 kilonewton range in terms of the failure. And the failure in the fist grips did occur just below the bottom fist grip. So that, that is where you're seeing the stress riser and you're seeing that. So it could, could it be, I mean, one theory is steel on steel is damaging the wires in the wire rope to an extent that that is going to be the point of failure still well within you know the requirement of the standard right. however if it's copper it's a softer metal on the wire rope so it's actually forming around the wires yeah. and kind of holding it together as opposed to it can crimping. conform more to the wire rope yeah. rather than actually making the wire rope conform to it right, to right, it. right, right. so again looking at the three fist grips that are were not properly torqued and we've got some further information on this a little later but one of the primary things to note here is look at the amount of extension we're clear out uh, basically almost double the amount of extension in terms of the head movement with the fist grips and you'll see a little later on exactly why and the failure even though the failure was still reasonable, still probably well within the 80% of the breaking strength of the wire rope, but when they weren't properly torqued, you get a lot of slippage. So if you didn't have that much of a tail line, and it it's going to pull, it's, you'll, you'll see, because I got a video here a little later on, you'll see what happens. and. You'll, you'll want to make sure that if you're riding a swing stage that's got fist grips as the termination approach, you're going to want to make sure whoever put them on had a torque wrench and was making sure that they were properly torqued. I don't think anybody in this room is suspending, hopefully, stages with fist grips. The tie, we use them for tie backs, and that's the challenge, too, to get them torqued properly in a tie back. Now, the other place that they're commonly used is on horizontal lifelines as well. And so your lifeline may be, you know, your lanyard may be tied to something that's tied into fist grips. Yeah, customer-owned so. equipment is where we say it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Rental equipment, no. Customer-owned equipment. Well, because they, yeah, re they, they want to reuse the wire rope at various lengths of various buildings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So U-clamps, um, again, if you look at U-clamps, which, you know, every, all of the literature and everything says don't use U-clamps. We're not supposed to use them in our industry. But if you look at them in terms of performance, they perform very well. Extension was a little bit more with the U-clamps. There's probably some slippage in there, but in terms of the braking force, they're well within what the, the better types of terminations are. And you, you, you torque these to what? Specified torque of what the manufacturer said that they should be torqued to. We didn't, I didn't do any of the U-clamps with a improper torque. Okay. The only thing that we did on U-clamps was we put them on backwards. 
to see what happened. Now you see a pretty distinct difference between when you put it on right and when you put it on wrong. Um, you didn't get as much extension and the braking force was down considerably when you put it on backwards. And it broke right at the... You, yeah, the U-clamps, oh, wow. every one of them, it, it, it's hard to tell exactly, but it almost appears that the wire broke directly under the clamp. So my, my you know, simple theory on U-clamps was it crushes the wire rope in one direction. You'll, you'll see that. Yeah, right? J-clamps crush it two directions, which is less damaging than one direction. That's always <laughs> been my theory. Well, it, it also has to do with uh, oh, sure, getting sure. it torqued. Because you have you have two bolts that are both going the same direction. So I take a torque wrench and I torque one down, and then I torque the other one down. Then I can torque the other one a little bit more, and the other one a little bit more. You're just going to keep. You'll never get the torque even on both. No, no, no. Right. Whereas with a fist grip and you're you're, you're ramming them both together, you can put exactly. a wrench on one of them and torque both of them basically at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and yeah. also this this actually crushes the rope. Yeah, right. yeah. Well, you, but you want to crush the dead end. Yeah. Is the idea. Well, are you sure you don't want to crush the light? <laughs> <laughs> um, on that on that last one, mm -hmm. is that the only one where you had a failure between the clamps? Yes. Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. And it actually it did fail in between the two U clamps. That's Although that's what I said, it's hard to tell. So I almost believe that it was actually failing right at, right underneath one of the U-clamps where you have crushed the wire. So it may appear that it's in between because the strands are actually, you know, broken in between. Okay. But it probably broke right at the clamp and kind of pulled out and would appear that it's in between the two clamps. Okay, so it wasn't like kind of mid-span between no, the two? No, the no, Okay, so it's still at the clamp. Okay. Yeah. The spelter socket, now one of the things that's interesting when you read about these, they'll tell you that you're supposed to take this spelter socket up to the full load that it's going to experience before you actually use it. <laughs> that's what it says if you read the literature on it because they want to actually force the thing down into the socket and get it fully seated in that socket before you actually start using it in service. So that presents a little bit of a dilemma um, because typically you're not gonna, not gonna probably do that. Um, to 11,000 pounds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but the performance, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> exceptional performance out of these sockets. And if you think about the way they work, it's actually a very good approach um, of how to terminate a wire rope. Failure, or is it something like you know, load is eighty percent? If you know it's good for eleven thousand, intended load. Yeah, intended, intended load. Intended, so, load. Okay. So, so yeah, you're not, if you're putting it on with a thousand pound hoist, okay. <laughs> we all, all right, know that it. a thousand pound hoist doesn't necessarily pull just a thousand pounds, but that's what right. you would you would preload it to a thousand pounds okay. to just make to sure that it's seated. For that particular load. Got it. So when you, you know, the, the, and the same goes for fist grips. That you're supposed to torque those, load them, and then retorque them. Torque. Correct. Which is hard to do on a tie back. And uh, so this is the the three eighths inch wedge socket. And I'll be honest. If any of you, hopefully nobody is doing it, but if any of you are using three eighths inch wedge sockets, because they're easier to find than five sixteenths. I would highly recommend to you that you quit doing that. <laughs> you'll, you'll see a video here in a second. But if you look at this, it, it, you know, this thing in terms of, you know, we're seeing everything up here at 50, 50 kilonewtons, and this thing is down at like 28 kilonewtons. And the extension is clear out to almost two inches on it. And this was the only sample out of everything, I, they're all catastrophic failures because we're failing the rope. This one was a significant catastrophic failure. And I've got a video, um, actually Kit provided all these videos, but we've got a video in here that you'll see of the, that 3 8 inch wedge socket. 5 16 inch wedge socket, properly sized for the rope that we're using. And the 5 16 even though the extension was pretty long, and I, I attribute that to the fact that you 
really have to pull and get that wedge seated in there before you actually start binding everything up. And so I think that's why the extension is longer with that, but uh, the performance is still, even though it is a little bit lower, it's still up in the range of where we would expect to see it, especially these are published at only 80% effectiveness. And then the Flemish Eye, again, whether you call it A, B, C, D, or whatever you call it, just, you know, a little more extension. And I think, the, again, the reason for the extension, if you look at that picture prior to the test, you can see that that thing is not real tight around the thimble. And I think the extension was actually pulling that thing tight around the extension. Kind of collapsing, before. collapsing the thimble. And, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You gotta see that in the curve. They, you know, it, yeah, it, it kind of starts it, shallow and then, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you're not getting a whole lot of force taken to get thumb, the extension at the beginning. Yeah. Right. Okay, so you look at all of them together and you say, all right, what, what does all of this testing actually mean? Well, you look at them, the first thing, the green line there is, is somewhat your baseline. So that's uh, about 11,160 uh, pound feet or whatever, pounds force versus the 10,725 published value for the wire rope. So you look at it and you go, wow, we've actually got five of them that made the wire rope better. Well, you know, there is variation in the wire rope. It's not all gonna be perfect. And what you see is, yeah, there's, there's a few of them that are slightly better. And what's interesting about that is, is you look at them, swedge, 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 socketed Flemish eye, which and our sample was swedge. So you look at it and you go, oh, well, all the ones that were swedge performed very well. Then you look at some of the other ones, the 516 wedge socket, still, I mean, if you look at it and you say, you know, 50,000 pounds, you take 80% of that, that's 40,000 pounds, or 40,000 kilonewtons, I'm sorry. That would say, virtually everything fell within 80% of the published value of the wire rope. So you go, okay, you can use all of them, other than that 3 8 inch wedge socket, and I'm telling you, you don't want to be doing that. Um, but you, you also look at it and you go, okay, you clamps installed backwards. Yeah, boy, that's getting clear down. You're, you're clear down right at 80%. Is that something that you really want to do? Because can you guarantee, you know, if you put it on right, U clamps installed correctly actually perform pretty decent. But can you guarantee that that guy that's out in the field that's installing those U clamps? We just heard a presentation this morning talking about you know, the fact that it's hard to find labor and everything else. So who knows who's in the field installing those U clamps? Are they putting them on right? We don't know. That's one question that you have to ask about fist grips as well. When it says you're supposed to torque them, are we getting them torqued to the right torque? So, but if you look at this, the things that kind of are red flags, when you look at it, you go, all in all, you can probably pick whatever methodology that you want, and it's probably gonna work fine. But let's look at these three red flags and see kind of what's going on with those. So, looking at, at the U-clamps, and you look at it just from the standpoint of what the wire rope looks like before we've done any testing or anything else on it, you can, you can pretty much look at it and go, we've damaged that wire rope before we did anything to it. And you know, and, and you look at the fist grip side, you compare the two and you can see why we would say fist grips are perfectly fine to use, but you don't want to be using U-clamps. So, Take that a step further, and you can actually, as you start looking at it, you can see that the strands are opening up and everything else. And you look at that, you can actually see the one strand completely separating from the rope in between the two of them, just from the force of putting the clamp on. You haven't put any load into it or anything yet. And then you look at the wire rope, so we put it on, 
the top one is actually after we tested, and you can see the amount of distortion in the wire rope. The bottom one, we haven't even put any load on that. All we did was install clamps and then take them back off. And the comment was made a little earlier about rental fleets and the fact that you know they want to use fist grips because they can adjust. They can adjust in the field. I can guarantee you if you use a U clamp, you take a you know a, a 300 foot cut of wire rope and say, well, I only need 150 foot. I'm gonna. You're not gonna use that thing at 300 feet again. If you are, you're violating the OSHA standards because of the amount of kink that's in that wire rope. I won't pass through a traction hose yeah. many times. <laughs> Makes for a good service call. So, and then, and, and then this is this is the actual close-ups of looking at those failures with the U clamps. And that's why I said, yeah, it's in between the clamps, but is it really in between the clamps, or is it really underneath the clamp where the failures are occurring? So why don't we just ban U clamps? They did. They did. Yeah, I mean, I mean they are. The, the standard well, says you're not did. supposed we to did. do that. They didn't. And you look at this, and I mean, what is interesting about it is it doesn't matter which way it's installed. You know, you're still damaging the rope. I mean, at least they tell you, you know, put the saddle on the right side because if you do that, you do the least amount of damage to the rope. But well, you know, presumably, what's going on is you have this really high stress concentration point wherever that that. The round part is right there, and you go back to your uh, eye splice, you're pulling on the eye, both sides of the rope are seeing a load. Yeah. So, no matter what, you're you've got a load on a, a spot that's got pretty good concentration on it. So. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to it's just like the test fixture that I use where we wrap it around five times and it's nice and gentle because we don't want stress risers. And you look at this and you go, that's the worst kind of stress riser you can introduce to wire rope, and that's why you're getting the failure there. Oh, oh, what's, I was going to say, what's interesting though, looking at this one, um, you have the properly installed one where the, you know, the saddle, the saddle is on the side that broke, yeah. and you kind of think that the saddle would, since it's flatter, it'd give you a little bit less stress concentration, and you, you'd break on the side where the, the U-clamp is going over it. There's another so, clamp up above this. Yeah, there's clamp. another clamp up. up. But, on the other, but, you, but you're not, you don't have any right load on the You don't have any load on that tail end. Yeah. It's just, it's it's interesting to see how that, that fracture works. You don't have any load on it, that's why I didn't. Mm -hmm. It's not loaded. So, and then uh, fist grips, you know, when improperly torqued, you have issues. So let's just watch. See the red line moving? Oh, yeah. Wow. So it, it's amazing. You see those three fist grips on there. They look like they're properly installed. Everything looks great. But there's what it looks like afterwards. Look at the distortion in the thimble. And look at how much relative movement that you got in that basically the... the dead side of the rope, how much it moved. So that's how much it pulled through those fist grips when you didn't have the proper torque on them. Yeah, when you say improperly torqued, not enough torque, I'm ten. assuming. Ten. Ten, yeah. ten, yeah. ten foot pounds instead of Ten foot pounds oh. instead of 30 foot pounds. That's what I said, I, how, how many, you know, how many guys are out there installing fist grips and it's just like, ah, yeah, that's tight enough. We had a guy run tests at our shop, it, platform. There's the same thing, just basically got a through this wrench, tightened it up, and, and you know, ran three, four, five, six tests, and finally one slipped, and it came across, hit him in the leg. Yeah, there, there's, there's a worse problem now um, with the popularity of battery operated yeah. impact yeah. guns. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, over, we found, over we found a, well, over torque or, or them, not, uh, them under torquing, we found a device called a torque limiting extension that will. You put it on there, you can, fit you can hammer it for an hour and a half, it's gonna put 30 foot pounds on it. So all our swing guys, we issued those to them because I, I went out to a job site and saw a guy doing it and I'm like, wait. It's, it's called a torque. What's it? Torque limiting extension. It looks like a normal socket extension. No, it's just like an extension but it will, and it's got but a... it will only, it'll twist at 30 foot pounds um, and they work well. But I, after he put them on with the gun, I went and got the torque wrench and Check one was 20, six because he didn't want to over tighten it and the rest of them were in the 37 38 39 um, they don't strip the way they used to in the old days when they were forged completely you'd strip it and then yeah. you know you over torqued it 
Uh, but now with the, with the pressed in. Uh, yeah, you got a regular area. fastener in there yeah. that'll take a it, lot more torque. Yeah, and so you can over tighten them really easy with a, with a gun that's going to put out 60 foot pounds, which is what most of the small impacts do. Yeah, imagine over torquing, you're going to start breaking the strands too. So you weaken it significantly. Mm -hmm. Well, they'll go into a certain point and the fist grip will hit itself. Well, that's like, that's like clamps. When you, if you test, you take your experience EMD guys and test them on putting right angle clamps on and check the torque, they'll all. This trap I've found in testing, if they're using a, you know, Craftsman 11 16 wrench, that they're generally between 28 and 34 um, because you go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and there's a feel. Um, but they're never, no, they're not. Yeah, they're, never, they're never to the actual yeah, exactly. spec. That's what I was going to say. How many people? actually have torque wrenches. I'm, I'm glad to hear that you've got this torque extension. I, I think that's a great thing. Everybody, every mechanic ought to have one of those out there in their toolbox to be able to use to make sure they're getting the proper torque. Time. Yeah. So here's the wedge fastener. Um, and again, this is, this is the reason that it's important to use what is specified and not what's conveniently available. If I can get the video going on this one. There we go. Notice the red line moving down. That's the slippage. Notice how much slippage there is in it. Notice the whole wedge moving down. So it's still not seated. Oh, it's seated. Oh, <laughs> oh, uh -huh. I, and I, I attribute this, I, I can't say 100% exactly what happened, but I believe when the wire rope failed, it didn't, you know, some of the strands failed, some of the strands were still there, and there weren't enough strands in between the wedge and the housing oh, in order to keep the wedge in that housing and you had of course the tensile machine still pulling the swing stage was hanging off of it it would still be pulling and we get the 100 percent separation and it's like that as we said out of everything that i saw in all the tests that was i, I saw that one and it's like that's that's a scary result so you, you have to make sure that you're sizing your hardware appropriately for the size of rope that you're using. Before it's use, would, was the wedge able to slide all the way through by hand? No. Okay. So it actually damaged the wedge. There you go. Yep. That's what it actually did to it. On the inside and yeah. the outside. So, but the, the idea that uh, well, you know, three eighths is close enough to five sixteen. So I'm just going to. Do, do you still have Crosby's uh, website on your phone? Yeah. Because they actually recommend doing this. What using uh, yeah. three eighths for five sixteenths? I believe they they also sell a fist a U bolt or a fist grip on the top of it. They're to prevent it from pulling. And in full disclosure, when I bought this, it has a what would be the equivalent of a so, saddle so clamp yeah. that goes on the, the wedge. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I specifically did not use that in the test because the, the 5 sixteenths one that I also purchased did not have that feature. And I said, if I'm doing apples to apples comparison, I want to be able to test them both without that saddle clamp on there. So I did not install that saddle clamp on, on the 3 8 one, even though it was provided. But I'm not sure that it would have changed the result drastically because it's on the, the dead yeah, side of the rope. It, it may have had the, it may have prevented the wedge from shifting sideways the way it did though. Possibly. Either way, I'm not getting Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know anybody who uses those to hang swing stations. Uh, I, I can tell you that the company that I used to work for, and I'll use those on the permanent installations that we put in in Philadelphia 35, 40 years ago. Oh, um, those things years. scare the hell out of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we've used them in boiler applications.
applications where you're, all you can yeah. do is pull a, pull a wire rope up through an opening. I, I, I can tell you that the only place that I've seen them used is on test stands. Oh, we, we, yeah, yeah, because it's well, they're used e it's test. easy to set your wire rope on your test stand using those. So a, a number of places I've seen where they're using those on their test stands. They're used on crane terminations. Yeah. Very common. So, um, and then I, I just put this slide in simply, you know, as a caution because the I didn't buy the aluminum compression sleeves from an actual manufacturer. I bought them from a distributor. And right on that distributor's website, it has big bold letters that say not for lifting. And so even though these things perform extremely well in the testing, you, you know, you're, you're, you're going against the manufacturer or the distributor's recommendation if they tell you don't use these for lifting. So, and these particular ones, as I said, the, the, where I bought them, a large distribution house that you can buy a lot of hardware and stuff from, and they say right on the, right on the site, right for this product, not for lifting. Not, not just saying not for personnel lifting, they say not for lifting in general. So, overall, what are our conclusions? Well, from my standpoint, I looked at it. You can draw your own conclusions. My conclusions were the swedge terminations are kind of, uh, at least what you saw in this testing, the swedge terminations are pretty much bulletproof. You know, you're getting 100% of the, of the wire rope strength when you're using those kinds of terminations. Um, you know, which ones performed adequately? There was a difference between the swedges with two swedges and with one swedge. And the two swedge terminations did perform better than the single swedge. So when you look at it, they performed adequately, but having that belt and suspenders is actually works a little bit better. Um, the fist grips, you know, I mean, they are a standard in the industry. You know, if properly installed, they work great. The 5 16 inch wedge socket, um, probably of all of those on that left hand side you know they probably that probably performed the worst but it's published at 80 percent and it was well above 80 percent um you know which ones perform poorly well you know as you saw fist grips if you don't install or if you don't torque them correctly u clamps for a variety of reasons and then i'll just leave it to say improperly sized terminations um, and then the exception on the aluminum. So you look at this and you go, okay, now we know what terminations that we're gonna use and everything else, but I also wanted to kind of finish up the presentation by just reminding everybody, you know, wire rope is a consumable. You know, as soon as you put it on there and you start using it, it starts to wear, it starts to deteriorate. So, you know, we have to follow what, what the OSHA regulations are, which says we're supposed to be inspecting that wire rope, which includes your terminations. You're supposed to be doing that by a, a competent person, and they're supposed to be doing it at the start of each work shift or after anything that has occurred that might have damaged the wire rope. So, and just as a reminder, taking it straight out of OSHA, you know, these are the things that you're supposed to be looking for. Now, I will say I did point out one thing here. OSHA says on diameter, it's an interesting way that they put it because everybody, I think everybody in the industry typically thinks 5% of the overall diameter that's time to replace the wire rope. That's not the way OSHA is written. OSHA actually says one third of the diameter of the outer wires. And it's like, well, how in the heck is anybody gonna be able to measure that? So, you know, that's, that's where the 5% reduction has come from. But again, that's the minimum criteria. And, you know, you, you're free to establish criteria that's tighter than that. I know the company that I work for actually has some criteria that is tighter than what the OSHA standard is, because we believe they go a little bit too far on a, on a few things. So, and with that, does anybody have any questions or comments? Yeah.
And I guess it's just for the group in general, since I know everybody in this expertise. Are. So most of the issues that you have, we see the under torque, over torque, or torque on, on the fish grips. Most of the problems that we have is the calibration of the torque range. And with you, what you said about that device, does it need to be calibrated? The one that you put on your... Uh... Technically, any device would need to be right. calibrated. So um, when I, the certification that I told you we went through to enable us to work at Sunoco, right. the determination we came to was the calibration is once a year. Right. We throw them out and buy new ones. They're, it's cost too much to calibrate it. So we did the same thing with the, with the torque extensions. We put a date on it. Uh, and. and and get rid of them after a year and, and just repurchase and not harbor freight torque wrenches. <laughs> right. So, hey, again, you, you got it to the <coughs> specs, which is, I was almost coming to you say, you said inches instead of foot, but then you have yeah, that, 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 which is fine. But that to me is the biggest issue that you see torque wrenches out, if you ever see them. Once you see them, you first thing you ask, what's the last time you calibrated this thing? And then you see, well, it's been a while, and then you know, they grab it and throw it on the side of the, on the back of the truck. You're like, dude, it's, it's ruined. Yeah, respect it. It's ruined. I mean, you should have uh, all, all equipment that has to be calibrated, should be calibrated at least annually. Correct. And it should be labeled right on it that, you know, when was the last calibration and when's the next one due. Just wanted to point out a couple of things. Fist grips, if you've ever read the package, Crosby only requires two. two. Yeah. The third one is the swing stage industry for safety. Uh, I went through National Telecom's training class for the Nyko Press swedging, and they only require one. The second one is something that we've adopted as for the same purpose as the third fist grip. Well, to be honest with you, I believe that initially we went from three fist grip clamps to one Nyko Press. And it just didn't look safe. Yeah. So we <laughs> added the second one. No, seriously, we added yeah. the second one when, to build up the when, because if it didn't look good, it wasn't good. Yeah. When we switched to Nyko Press, we were getting the wire ropes back from the field with a fist grip in between them. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, where'd you get it? <laughs> and tie back. I thought I thought three fist grips was uh, part of subpart L. Yeah. Well, well but, but that's an OSHA requirement. But Crosby didn't. Crosby, yeah, Crosby does, does not. not. But that's for lifting men, you need three. Yeah. Okay.